Uh, great to see so many people have uh, have turned up on for what for me is a, a sunny Saturday morning, uh, even if uh, it's unlikely to tempt any butterflies out due to the cold wind. Um, but uh, but but good morning and welcome to the 2024 UK Butterfly Recorders meeting. Um, I must say it was great last year to uh, see so many people face to face and. Um, and feel that enthusiasm and buzz in the room. But I also hope that you'll get as much out of today as well and, in, and enjoy the, the, the program that uh, is, is on for this morning. Um, last year, my colleagues and I spoke about the Supporting Science Project that's now come to an end, um, but we really remain quite excited about all that it has achieved in terms of improving data flow, supporting county recorders and improving online collaboration. And it's great to see that many people are dipping into the county recorder toolkit on the, B B on the BC website. It's not just for county recorders. There's loads of really useful information in there. So please do go and have a look. Um, and this is a resource we want to continue to evolve over time. And so if you've got any uh, thoughts on any other useful resources that could be added, do get in touch with, with Zoe. Also, another achievement from the Sporting Science Project was, was that now we've got 46 million moth and butterfly records on the MBN Atlas. Um, so that's a fantastic resource that's available to anybody to go and see what species are on their doorstep. Um, the Sporting Science Project was funded by both the National Lottery Heritage Fund and the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Why mention that? Um, it's partly because there was a really rigorous uh, evaluation exercise that they required, which um, can cause a bit of a groan at times when you have to go through those sorts of processes. But it was really well done. We had some external help on that. And it was really good to see uh, as part of that, the comments from people who were involved, which were both positive and and some not so not so good ones. Um, and I did read through them uh, um, again in advance of this meeting to see if I could just pick some out. But to be honest, none of them made sense without the context. And I haven't got time to really go through all of that. Um, but just to say a, a thank you again for all those of, who, who've been involved in the Supporting Science Project. And we're certainly going to look to build on that work um, uh, over the coming years. Um, another major advance in 2023 was the development of our new volunteer portal, Assemble. And this system's now being rolled out to help support all of Butterfly Conservation's volunteers, whether members or not, and uh, to help uh, meet our legal and uh, insurance obligations. But also for recorders themselves, it also gives you access to additional training opportunities, uh, news and uh, a forum to contact other volunteers and uh, via, via uh, a messaging service. Now, this this assembly has been rolled out as, as we speak. And um, if you've not had an invitation to join, please go and visit the volunteering at butterflyconservation.org website and uh, they'll be able to send you some information on how to register. And of course, as well as all the pleasure and wonder of recording butterflies, ultimately the data underpins all of our conservation action and the measure and is a measure of the, whether that's been a success or a or a failure. Um, understanding the changing range and status of species is critical in adapting to climate change and understanding how our butterflies are affected. An example is the coverage of marsh artillery in Scotland, where since 2020, volunteer monitoring of larval webs has increased greatly such that we're now be able to generate a Scotland trend for the first time for that species. And we're also now really expanding our work on large heath across the UK, a species that's historically been under recorded because it's on remote sites that are subject to, to poor weather. Um, so making it uh, making access uh, a little bit more difficult. Recording also gives us insights into changing flight periods and implications for management practices we recommend. We're able to follow the wood white, silver wash fertility and purple emperor as they continue their expansion into central and, and eastern England and providing suitable habitat management advice to landowners that have never encountered species like that is really important. So at the start of a packed morning of talks, I'd just like to say a big thank you for all of the passion that goes into recording and conserving butterflies and the inspiration you give to others who uh, to get involved. 
A final reminder that uh, the coming recording season is a key one, as it's the last in the current five-year recording cycle. So please check out all those under-recorded places in your patch. And also just, to, just to, to flag that we're planning some sort of celebration as we're coming up to uh, 25 years since the highly influential uh, Butterfly Millennium Atlas was published. And we'll let you know more about those plans when they're finalised. Anyway, I'm going to sit back and enjoy today's talks um, uh, along with the rest of you. And in the meantime, I'm just going to hand you back to Richard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Russell. Uh, great to see the chat's working. Lots of lovely messages coming in. We've got people joining us from all over Britain and Ireland, from uh, England, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, Isle of Man, the Republic of Ireland. It's great. We've got a few uh, people watching from overseas, which is fantastic. China, I think, is the furthest that I've uh, spotted in the uh, in the chat. So welcome to all of you. Uh, Great to see all the weather reports from across the uh, across the world coming in. You'll all be relieved to know that it is sunny in Durban, South Africa. So that is good to know, and uh, and great to be joined from uh, uh, from South Africa. So we will crack on uh, with the talks. As Russell said, it's a packed program, um, and the the first few talks, as is always the case with these meetings, uh, is a little review of where things are at with the various. Uh, Butterfly Recording and Monitoring Schemes run by Butterfly Conservation and UK Centre of Ecology and Hydrology and, and others. So we will start that ball rolling uh, with Dr Zoe Randall. Zoe, are you there? I am, Richard. I am. And hopefully you should be able to... Yeah, it's happening. Now, come on, load up the slideshow. There yeah, we go. Super. That looks good. Excellent. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm uh, Zoe Randall. I'm Senior Surveys Officer at Butterfly Conservation, and I'm going to give you an update on the Butterflies for the New Millennium recording scheme. So Butterflies for the New Millennium scheme was established in 1995. It's for ad hoc butterfly sightings. So I like to refer to it as a Chinzano scheme, um, any butterfly anywhere at any time, recorded by anybody. It covers the UK, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. And we've got over 17.1 million butterfly records in the BNM. And they go back as far as 1690. The data are used um, for lots and lots of our work, um, especially the uh, five yearly or so cycle of the state of the UK's butterflies reports, all of which are, are available on the Butterfly Conservation website. So the number of records in the BNM is increasing year on year. Um, this graph here shows the number of records per year from 1995 up to 2022. And um, on average, across this period, we've received just over 603,000 records on an annual basis. But looking at this for just the last sort of few years, so from 2018, 19 and 2020, we're now getting on average 1.2 million butterfly records per year. So thank you to everybody who sends in their data. Now, as I noticed, uh, I mentioned this data goes up to 2022, um, but you can see here we've got very few records. That's not because the butterflies have all disappeared. Um, it's just that we've been very busy migrating the butterflies for the new millennium database from Levana into Recorder 6. And so that 17.1 million records have been transferred by our database manager, Les Hill. So obviously that's put a, that's scuppered our, our data import process a little bit because Les has been tied up with that. But he's um, got some enlisted the assistance of the fabulous Jim Asher and Jim is helping Les work through the backlog of butterfly records so we can get them into the into the BNM. So thank you to Les and, and to Jim. So I thought I'd take a look and see what the um, what what species of butterfly have got the most records in the BNM. And in the first place, we've got the meadow brown. Uh, no surprise, it flies at the peak peak of the season in the summer. In fifth place, we've got the lovely beautiful peacock. In tenth place, the common blue. And in fifteenth place, the painted lady. And in twentieth place, we've got the small skipper. 
And then I thought it'd be interesting to look at the number of butterfly records that are submitted month by month to the to the BNM. And um, you can see we've got a really nice sort of normal curve here. Very few records in the winter months, about 9,000 records in, in January, um, creeping up to a million in April, doubling to 2 million in, in June, and then a whopping 5.4 million butterfly records submitted at the peak of the season in July. And then we start to tail off again, 4.2 in August, 1.3 million in September, and then much lower numbers in October, November and December. So I thought, well, which species are the most recorded each month? And um, so here we are. I'll just give you a quick run through for the year. So January, um, the most the most records we've got in the BNM are for the brown hair streak. Obviously, this won't be for the adult stages. These will be for egg counts. In February, we've got the beautiful brimstone. I've finally seen one this year. In fact, I saw five on Wednesday, which was lovely. In March and April, we have the beautiful peacock butterfly topping the charts. And in May, the orange tip. June and July, no surprises here, um, the meadow brown. August is small white. September, the speckled wood. October and November is the red admiral. And then again in December, we've got the brown hair streak. And obviously, again, these will be egg counts. So. Despite the fact that we've got all this recording happening and everyone submitting their records, which is absolutely fantastic, we do still have some under-recorded areas. And the butterflies from the new millennium data were used alongside the National Moth Recording Scheme data to develop this tool called Decide. So basically, it's to encourage recorders to go to new places and places where records are needed most to inform land management practices and the, the planning uh, planning. Um, planning process. So on the map here, I've just chosen Derby because apparently that's bang slap in the middle of the UK. And we've got uh, Carly Butler speaking later from the University of Derby. So I thought it's quite appropriate. And you can see here on the map, we've got little yellow areas and those areas are high priority for recording. And the tool will give you little, little um, map symbols and you can click on and it will tell you more about the habitat in that area, the number of species you're likely to encounter and what the access is like and lots of other things. So please do this year, decide to go somewhere different if you can. Um, you can toggle the radio, radio buttons on, on the side here and choose different months. And it also works for day flying moths and butterflies. So please do decide to go somewhere different. And you may decide to go somewhere different to do your big butterfly count. So this year's count runs from the 12th of July to the 4th of August, we've got the 20 target species for England and Wales, uh, 17 for Scotland, I think 15 for Northern Ireland. So, um, so please do get involved. And, and Carly Butler will be speaking later about some research we did with Big Butterfly Count participants and the impact of taking part in this survey on mental health and well-being. So I thought this is Prime opportunity to give you a quick run through of the key headline results from the Big Butterfly Count last year. So um, it was fantastic because both participants and counts were up enormously on 2022 levels, despite the fact that it was a bit of a washout season. As soon as the Big Butterfly Count launched, Big Butterfly Count was launched, the rain came down, the heavens opened, and it was torrential rain on the day of the launch. But um, and we had very unsettled weather. So well done to everybody who managed to find a window of sunshine to get out for the count. Um, this chart here just shows the headline species results. The overall winner was the Red Admiral, came in pole position for the first time ever in the Big Butterfly Count. And numbers were up, the average number per count was up 338% on 2022 levels. Other winners include the peacock butterfly, the holly blue, and the silver Y moth. And what I find really heartening about this graph is we've got a lot more blue lines to the right, so percentage change in terms of average number per count has increased from 2022 to 2023, and only sort of five species that fared worse in 2022 compared to uh, in 23 compared to 2022. 
So another thing we've managed to do with the big butterfly count data last year is we've developed a method to correct for the phenology problem with the three week survey. We'll all be familiar that um, the butterfly season is variable. If we've got a cold spring, that's likely to delay flight periods. If we've got a warm spring, that will um, move the flight periods of species is earlier. So this, this correction enables us um, to this, this method is, enables us to correct for this phenology, phenology problem. And the chart here shows um, butterflies on the right that have got positive trends for the 13 year, 13 year series, and the red lines show um, species that have had a negative, have got a negative trend over that 13 year period. So, and the ones with the stars are statistically significant. So again, we've got red admirals faring well over the 13 year period, um, holly blue and um, painted lady along with large white and small copper. Whereas we've got the gatekeeper, the small tortoise shell, the ringlet and another suite of species that are declining in, in the big butterfly count over this 13 year period. But we're really excited about this, this new method and um, and they'll be, we'll be developing it further and, and uh, you know, it's great that we can develop, you know, we can calculate 13 year or long, long to long, medium to long term trends using big butterfly count data. So a quick reminder about the big butterfly count. So please do get out this year, out for the count. Um, use the decide tool to find somewhere new and you can use this tool for any recording that you do and in indeed for butterfly uh, day flying moths and um, nocturnal moths as well and just a reminder of the dates for this year it runs from the 12th of july to the 4th of august so please do take part and then just before i finish i'd like to let you know that as russell alluded to um the butterflies for the new millennium um there's a derived data set publicly available on the nbn atlas there's 15.8 million butterfly records on there um, up to 2019. The data are displayed at tetrad resolution unless they're further blurred to 10 kilometers squares for sensitive sites and sensitive species. There's no recorder name or determiner name in there or site names or comments. And this um, data set is freely available for non-commercial use from the MBN Atlas. So please do feel free to dive in and, and, and have, a, have an explore around the data set. So we've got a tight packed programme today and I'm just about on time. So I'd like to thank every single butterfly recorder out there. Without your records, we couldn't do what we do to conserve butterflies and moths. Um, I'd like to thank the county butterfly recorders and their verification assistants, <coughs> collate the local data and, um, and do all the verification. And obviously I'd like to thank our partners, funders, and of course you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, next up is uh, Ian Middlebrook, who's going to give a uh, an update and a summary about the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Richard. Can you see that? Yes, that looks great. Thank you. Excellent. OK, well, I'll just leave it there then, shall I? <laughs> right. OK, thanks very much. So, yeah, I'm Ian Middlebrook. Um, I manage BC's contribution to the UK butterfly monitoring scheme. So I'm just going to talk very quickly for a few minutes uh, about what's been happening with that scheme and, and moving forward as well. So I'll uh, start off by stealing a little bit of Mark Sunder from later to talk about the, the number of sites that were monitored last year. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Purple Hair Streak, the new monitoring methodology for Purple Hair Streak that we launched last year and see how that data has been going. I'm going to talk uh, hot off the press. We have a new national agreement with Forestry England. Uh, which is relevant to transect walking on forestry sites. So I'm going to quickly mention that. And then looking forward um, towards 2025, I'm going to say something very briefly about our plans for the uh, 50th anniversary celebrations of the UK BMS. So moving quickly on to the coverage. Um, so here we are. So this is this is um, the number of sites that are monitored each year across the, the history of the scheme. And as you can see, we've managed to hit um, another new record uh, for the scheme, um, continuing on the tra trajectory that uh, that we were on before COVID hit. Um, so yeah, this, so for last year, over 3,300 sites were monitored. So that's a fantastic effort from all the volunteers and coordinators um, to, to produce that result. 
and that includes a record number of standard transects. So um, 2,221 standard transect sites um, were monitored last year. And this is the uh, this is the top five, in fact, top six branches in terms of uh, transect coverage. So fantastic. So congratulations, of course, to, to Ken Orp and uh, along with Richard and Steve in the East Midlands branch, uh, who've managed to stay, stay at the top of that table for another year. Um, but also a big thanks to all the other coordinators, to Andy Barker and his team in Hampshire, to Bill Downey, to John Tilt, Mark Chapman and Nick Hall, and all the other coordinators that I won't have time to mention by name. But nevertheless, we wouldn't be breaking these records, records in terms of number of transects, in terms of number of monitored sites each year. We wouldn't be able to break these records if it wasn't for the fantastic efforts of all you, all you coordinators and all you volunteers that, that, that put the time in to make that possible. So thanks very much. Uh, the number of new sites, so we had 241 new transects set up last year, and this is the branches uh, where most of those sites were. So you can see some of the some of the same branches, but also um, uh, Somerset creeping in there as well. There were 19 new sites, so thanks to Peter, Peter Bright for that. Um, and I'm just going to talk, so Yorkshire at the top of the tree there were the most new transects. So I'm just going to look a little bit more closely at Yorkshire and the fantastic work that Nick Hall has been doing up there. So number of transects in Yorkshire has more than doubled um, since 2018. And if we look at that year by year over the last 10 years, you can see 10 years ago, there were just 20 odd transects. And now there are nearly 100. And that's uh, a big chunk of that is down to the fantastic efforts of Nick Hall up in Yorkshire. So well done, Nick. Keep that going. That's brilliant. And obviously, a lot of these coordinators put in a lot of a lot of time and effort. Um, if you're an experienced transit walker in your area and you think you can you can offer some assistance because by the time you get up to 100 100 plus sites that you've got to coordinate in your area that's that's a lot of work so if you think you can offer some assistance to any of our brand uh, transit coordinators then, then please do get in touch with them okay so moving on to talk about the purple hair streak uh, methodology uh, so that so we we had a couple of trial years um, where we we tested um, what we wanted to do and, and managed to settle on settle on methodology that we launched last year. So rather than, than a fixed route, um, this is uh, a series of fixed points. So it's, it's an early evening count. Um, we carried out by looking up at the, the canopy uh, where the purple hair streaks are flying in the early evening period. And it's a series of fixed points. So one or two trees um, for a fixed period of time. So maybe two, three minutes at each at each point. Here's an example of, of uh, uh, the setup for one of one of these new new uh, um, sites. So you can see they've identified on the map where the survey locations are for each each uh, point count, and then in the description for for each of these counts, there will be a description of which trees are being monitored, where from, and how long at each on each occasion, so that we get the consistency that we need week after week, year after year, to give us uh, decent abundance data that we can use to, to contribute to trends. Now, last year, purple hair streaks were recorded on 340 monitored sites in the UK, and that includes 20 new sites that were set up using this new methodology. And you might think, well, if it's already being recorded on 300 plus sites, why do we need, why do we need something new? When the reality is that on standard transects, Purple hair streaks generally only get picked up in very low numbers, ones and twos, um, and it's quite difficult to produce meaningful trends from such low numbers. So we re really want some more, uh, more meaningful abundance data from sites where we can uh, do a bit more analysis. And if we see what the result of this is, so so last year across all sites there were there were ninety one weekly counts that made it into double figures. And these 20 new sites using the new methodology accounted for 62% of those already. So you can see the, this new methodology is, is producing higher numbers that we can start to get more meaningful abundance data from. And just to emphasize that point a little bit more, these are the, these are the 10 sites um, that produced the highest uh, total abundance counts for purple hair streaks across last year. And eight of those 10 sites utilize the new methodology, the ones highlighted by PHS. So that's great. So it'd be great to get more people involved um, and more people setting up Purple Hair Street uh, transects in their area. Um, so best way to get involved is to take a look at the, at the uh, guidance that we've produced on our website. So if you go to the guidance form 
on the UKBMS website. There's the address there. Um, towards the bottom of the page, you'll see um, uh, Purple Hair Street Monitoring Guidance Notes, which is an explanation of, of how you carry out the monitoring. And then there's mapping guidance for how you how you actually set it up on the UKBMS website. Um, so how you would draw out um, that map of, of survey points and fill in the details that are required um, for each survey point in terms of which trees, where from, how long. OK, moving quickly forward, I'm trying to make up a, a minute or two here. Um, so Forestry England, uh, we've worked very hard with them over the last year. Rachel in particular, who's coming up next. Rachel's worked fantastically hard with them over the last year to develop a national agreement um, which covers uh, uh, UK BMS Transex, because in recent years, I know across large areas of the country, it's become more and more bureaucratic trying to organise permits to get out and walk transects on, on forestry land. Um, and it's become uh, quite time consuming for, for volunteers and coordinators. So we tried to um, uh, work towards a national agreement uh, where Forestry England recognised that walking transects is really a very low risk activity. It's something it's basically walking along a path, counting butterflies and anyone could do that in their spare time. So why do we need all these special special permits to go out and do it? Um, so the result of those discussions, um, we have we now have a 10 year partnership agreement. So it's long term. It sets out how the two organisations um, are going to work together towards our sort of mutual objectives in terms of conservation and recording and monitoring. And the the agreement itself acts as an umbrella permission for these activities, which includes butterfly transects. Now, there is there is a condition of this agreement. Um, that in order to be covered by the agreement, you do need to register with Butterfly Conservation's um, volunteer database. So that's the Assemble database that Russell mentioned earlier. Um, and hopefully you've already been contacted. Um, you, I know Rachel's been working very busy with the volunteers and coordinators to let everybody know about this. Um, but yes, it is a requirement that if you're going to be walking Transex on Forestry Commission land, in order to be covered by this agreement, uh, you do need to be registered on our Assemble system. Uh, so please, please cooperate with that. But once once you've registered, that's it. It's a, it's a one time thing and that avoids uh, any need to go back and sort out permits year after year. Um, I say this is a 10 year agreement, so we've got a nice long term agreement with the organisation. Um, so hopefully that will make things a lot easier moving forward. And then finally, um, before we move on, I just want to look towards next year. So um, 2025 will actually mark, so never mind this, 25 years celebration of, of the of the atlas 2025 will mark 50th year of surveys for the uk bms uh, so we think that is definitely something worth worth celebrating um and the, we, we've had various discussions and there are sort of plans afoot but we're also looking towards volunteers to, to, to come up with ideas as well what we'd love what we'd love to have is a series of, of outdoor events throughout the summer um and uh, we're looking for obviously volunteers to help put those forward but we'll, we'll certainly offer guidance from um from our end and uh, anything anything that needs to be sort of done across the board we'll provide um but we will need people to to come up with ideas for places to hold these um whether it might be somewhere that's had a long running transit that other people would like to see that's like that kind of thing um we've had a few uh, suggestions put forward already uh, we're looking for more 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 places more volunteers to come forward perhaps from from wales and from the east of england um uh, but uh, yeah uh, if you've got ideas get in touch with rachel and we'll see what we can do to help you we'll also think about one or two challenges across the year maybe trying to break the record of the number of transects walked during a week maybe um, help people to to uh, reinvigorate some long-running transects that have fallen by the wayside that sort of thing again any ideas let us know um there will be an end of season celebration conference which we'll try and hold in a, in a, a central location where there'll be several um sort of uh, presentations and across uh, the next two or three years there will also be some scientific papers uh, connected with the 50th anniversary but uh, detailing or, or summarizing the data that's been collected and also reviewing all all the ways that that data has been used across the years uh, so keep an eye out for those and then uh, finally of course it just another big thank you to everybody who's involved in, in the UK BMS our amazing volunteers and our coordinators who put in all that time it's uh, just walking a transect itself is a is a big commitment for a lot of volunteers we're aware of that and we're really grateful for everybody 
who goes to that effort for us and, and supplies us with that data. So thanks very much to them. And, and thank you, of course, to all, all our partners in, in, in the scheme as well. Thanks very much. So we'll move straight on then to the final contribution in this uh, little feedback uh, session uh, and I'll hand over to Rachel Conway, who's going to give a bit of feedback about the wider countryside butterfly survey. Rachel, great, thanks, that, that's Richard. looking great. Good, excellent. Hello, everybody. Um, Rachel Conway, Butterfly Monitoring Officer, and lovely to be back again for another year to feedback on the wider countryside butterfly survey. Um, oh, technical problem. There we go. So the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey is part of the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and this is run in partnership uh, with the BTO, UKCH and JNCC. And it's a landscape scale survey of randomly generated one kilometre squares, broadly based on the BTO's breeding bird survey. So the BTO vols, uh, volunteers can contribute as well via their squares. And the aim of the survey is to better understand how butterflies are faring outside of the good habitats um, and nature reserves, et cetera, where standard transects tend to be located. So the survey runs on these one kilometre squares and the ideal is to have these two one kilometre transect lines running through the square separated by 500 metres. Now, of course, that's the ideal. It's very rarely seen on the ground and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to plan um, a sensible route. So I do just want to let you know that there are several allowances that can be applied and you can find out about these via the wider Countryside Butterfly Survey methodology video, which is in the guidance and recording forms page of the website. So if you if you take a look at a site and you think, no, I can't, I can't possibly get two parallel lines through that, there are some allowances that we can help you with. Um, so the standard UK BMS weather criteria is applied to these sites and the core survey period is July and August. And I would like to draw your attention to the core period. Um, all wider countryside butterfly survey contributes to the UK BMS database. However, when I do the annual occupancy analysis, I only use squares that have rec received a survey in July and August separated by 10 days. So please do bear that in mind when you're planning your surveying over July and August, although I accept that this is um, quite often easier said than done. So on to 2023 summary. So talking about things less easier said than done, the weather was very poor last year. Although it was the warmest year on record, it was also very wet. It was wetter than average across all of the countries. And in Northern Ireland, it was the wettest July ever. And it was the third wettest summer since the series began in 1936. And I'm speaking from experience, it was terrible. So despite these wet conditions, which really particularly hampered the core survey period, 630 recorders got out and surveyed, um, sorry, conducted almost 2000 surveys across um, 795 squares. They counted almost 143,000 butterflies. 94% of the squares received a survey in July and August, and 68% of those squares received the core period um, um, surveys of one in July and August separated by 10 days. So onto the species results for 2023. The most widespread species um, was meadow brown. It occupied 92% of all um, squares surveyed during the core period. And overall occupancy was up across all of the wider countryside species, except for ringlet, which was slightly down by 3%. Although small tortoiseshell only made it by a 1% increase. It's no surprise that red admiral had a great year. It was um, it had the highest increase in occupancy overall, um, up 45% to 90% occupancy. And it was the best year for Red Admiral occupancy since the survey began in 2009. Holly Blue also had a great year. It had, was the second highest increase in occupancy um, by 40% to occurring to 50% of all squares um, surveyed during the core period. And in good news, it was also recorded for the first time on a wider countryside butterfly survey square in Scotland. 
Um, so that was really exciting. And that was on a square near Woodham at Newport on Tay in Fife. Our big headline for the year was a large tortoiseshell seen on a BBS square near Wealdon in Sussex. And that's the first time that large tortoiseshell has been recorded um, on a wider countryside butterfly survey during the core period. So some more recording headlines for you. The most visited BC square were, uh, received 17 visits and that was um, a square at Hapton, Norfolk. And the most visited Breeding Bird Survey Square received eight visits um, at Hilton in County Durham. So well done to, to those two recorders. Um, the highest counts in England, it was 196 Meadow Brown at a square near Tenterden, Ashford in Kent. In Wales, it was 24 Peacock at uh, Blinau Dol Witherland in Conway. In Scotland, it was 32 Small Tortoiseshell at Mansion in Tweedsmuir in the Scottish Borders. And in Northern Ireland, it was 14 small tortoiseshell at a square in Ballykelly, County Derry, London Derry. Also of note is the maximum habitat specialist count, which was 50 silver studded blue in Burley in the New Forest. And my, oops, the daisies. And also of note are um, the grayling reports here and my um, my Zoom bar is sitting right across that detail, so I can't read it. So you'll just have to read that one for yourself. But well done for that report. Of, I think it was 50 grayling and also 10 large heath here at um, Fort William in the Highlands. So growth. Wider countryside butterfly survey growth is always a little bit up and down. And this year it was a little bit down. Um, just by 6%. So we're hoping this is a reflection of the bad weather. Um, so fingers crossed for a good season this year and that we can bounce back. Any growth this year was to be celebrated. And these are the areas that achieved uh, a, gr a growth greater than 10%. In Northern, uh, Northeast England, um, Val Standen managed an increase of five butterfly conservation squares, which was an excellent result. And East Midlands, um, Ken Orp and his team increased their coverage by over by 50% with 10 squares. This is a fantastic result. Eight of these squares were breeding bird survey squares. And I know that Ken worked with James at the BBS to um, help increase coverage um, through the BTO in the East Midlands. So I'll take this opportunity to thank David and James for their support in promoting the scheme. James um, Hayward at the BTO has been very committed to increasing BBS take up. And despite a dip of 22 squares um, in the BBS coverage this year, there were actually 31 new BBC squares um, submitted to the wider countryside scheme. So that's testament to the efforts that David and James put in. And thank you to, to you. Um, and well done to the other branches for having for, for growth this year in what was a particularly difficult year. So Louisa Madison, champion for Glasgow and Southwest Scotland. Lincolnshire, that's a vacancy. So somebody took that on themselves. So well done. Um, Hearts and Middlesex, that's Andrew Wood and Upper Thames, Peter Philp. So thank you to those champions for your efforts. So last week at the at the Scottish gathering, I shared some squares that had long data runs uh, that hadn't been walked for the last couple of years and needed picked up. And I actually had a couple of recorders come to me at the end and fill those squares and transects. So I thought I would do the same this week. We These are three nearly, really nice squares. They are well mapped, they're accessible, they've got good parking, they've got well marked paths and they go through nice sites. And this one near Nettleswell in Harlow, Essex has two very aptly named pubs, the small copper and the purple emperor within the square. So if you get a bit thirsty halfway through your, your um, survey, you can stop and avail of their services. If you were interested in any of these squares, you can contact me at survey at butterfly-conservation.org. Holiday squares, this is something else I'd like to promote. These are squares that occur in areas with low walkers but um, low numbers of walkers, sorry, but they are holiday destinations. So it, you can visit them one off. So it's a no commitment way of dipping your toe into the survey and seeing if, if you enjoy it. Um, you can have a look at the holiday squares section of the website to find out what's available near you. You'll find it here under the My Data tab. 
And I think this could be a very nice way to spend a summer. In fact, I'm planning as kind of a retirement of going around doing squares of Scotland. It's a bit like Munro bagging, but less tiring. So if you fancy taking on a square near your, near your holiday destination, then please do check out what's available. So finally, news to thank the champions who are leaving us this year, Jackie Adams, Hampshire and Isla White, David Prince, Norfolk, Scott Martin, the West Midlands and Kirsty Ross in the Highlands. They've all given several years of dedication to the scheme and I'd like to thank them for their efforts over the years. And so now we have some vacancies. So we have vacancies in Norfolk, Lincolnshire, West Midlands and the Highland. This is um, a role where you can receive training and induction and a lot of support from me. Um, you don't need a great deal of experience. There's time and space for you to develop within the role. So if you fancy having a go at, at being a champion, please do let me know. And it's a role that you can carry out digitally as well. There's an awful lot you can do to help us digitally. You don't necessarily need to be able to go around and meet people in person. So if you think that you can offer something, please do get in touch with us. And this is a good opportunity for me to thank all of the champions involved in the wider countryside butterfly survey. So just to finish off, um, Thank you to everybody who's involved in the survey and other big thanks. There's a lot of work that goes into all of the data that is collated through the UK BMS. And there's data submitters, there's recorders, mentors, champions. And of course, there's all of our colleagues across the partner organisations. So thanks to everyone for your efforts and uh, very much look forward to a good season next year and good luck. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rachel. That's great. Um, we're running slightly over time, not that that's uh, not, not blaming you for that, but um, people have been answering the questions in the Q&A uh, live as the speakers have been going along. So I think that's working really well. So we will move on with the programme and uh, the main event. If uh, uh, This is where I need a kind of sound effect of a big drum roll uh, to introduce uh, Mark Botham from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, with your sneak preview, we're uh, we're always really grateful at these meetings. We get a sneak preview of the <laughs> results, uh, the official UK butterfly monitoring scheme results from 2023. So over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, you can see that okay, presumably. Just checking because I'm usually the one yeah. with the most technical that looks good. issues. That looks good, and we can hear you more amazingly. I know I got a headset. It's a it's an advance, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure people have been doing this for years, but I'm a bit of a bit of a luddite. Um, yes, welcome everyone. So, as Richard says, I'm Mark Botham from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and I'm a, kind of tasked with doing the analysis each year for this and working with Richard and Ian very closely. It's an amazing thing to get to see this data and work with it. Um, I've put. Red Admiral on this cover slide here, it's uh, been a phenomenal year for this butterfly and it, I, I kind of had quite a playful time with it. In my talks, I always have to give photos from other people because I've realised that I'm actually very bad at taking photographs. And I, 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 I can't speak. An example here is that I tried to dig through all my photos because Red Admiral had such a good year. I thought, I've got loads of photos of this. I saw so many on my transect and this is all I could come up with. Um, this, oh, wait, I'm having a technical fault still. Great. Slides on. There you go. So this is the kind of photo that Mark Botham takes. Can you see the red amble in there? Not great, is it? Um, but if you can see it in the middle of the screen there, this is a bit of bramble and which goes around two thirds of the edge of the site that I walk each year. And every bit of bramble at one point had at least one of these red animals on it and often between four and 10. And I've never seen so many of this butterfly. And more than usually, although this is quite typical towards the end of the season, I saw loads throughout the entire year, right from the start through June, July, and then again, a real peak at the end of the season. So great stuff. Now, Rich has just said this is a sneak preview, so I always put this up. Please don't share these results until we get the press release out because we like to get as much impact as possible. So I just uh, reiterate that. Uh, sorry to be boring there. And then moving on to this slide, which you've just seen from Ian. And Ian, you're not stealing my thunder at all. I just think this is a perfect opportunity to reiterate how amazing it is that we get this increase on sites every year. As you say, just in the in the year with COVID, there was a slight dip, but even then it was still a phenomenal year. And again, with this increase in transit sites and targeted surveys, including the uh, the purple 
Hare Street counts that go into the traditional transect area there. And you can see the massive great coverage that we've got across the UK. So it's just a phenomenal achievement. And I just want to reiterate at this point, the thanks to all the volunteers and county recorders, uh, the, the transect coordinators, because it's just absolutely phenomenal. So thank you very much. So what kind of a year was it? We've already heard that the weather was pretty bad, especially for the time when certain surveys were taking place. It was a very mixed year, in my opinion. It started off really kind of, where are all the insects? And people were really concerned. There was a lot of things going around on social media asking if insects are having an insect again and stuff like that. And then it suddenly exploded into life. And I'll, I'll kind of show the details of that as we go on. But actually, it was an above average year. So it was, it was better than 2022, as you can see here. Um, it, it was ranked 23. I've, can't get rid of sorry about this my face is over the top of things can let's get rid of that for sure so yeah 23rd and and you can see there that 30 species in total showed an annual increase and 27 species showed a decrease and just one species so no annual change compared to 2022 but importantly this oh and now what's going on <laughs> Importantly, when we look at these annual changes, that just tells us about what kind of a year it was. And what we want to know is how things are faring compared to their long term. So what I put up here, just to show you how kind of a mixture it was, is exactly half the species produced an index of abundance in 2023 that was above the long term average for that species. And 29 species produced an index that was below that long term average. So a really mixed year across the species uh, of which we're able to do monitoring, which I should have said is all but one species, which is the mountain ring that just simply we don't quite have enough data for that yet. But for everything else, because of these increased efforts to record species in uh, more remote locations and countries where traditionally they weren't recorded as well, we're now able to do it for 58 species, which is remarkable and absolutely brilliant. So very quickly, four species managed to record their best year on record here, the large blue checkered skipper and brimstone, and no surprises, we've heard it several times already, the red admiral. And two species recorded their worst on record, uh, small turtle shell and small purple to fertility. And small turtle shell is just, it's a bit bonkers really when I think about it, because it's the exact opposite to red admiral for me. When I was young, I grew buddlias all the way around my uh, mum's garden, because that's how I got to see butterflies in urban Nottinghamshire. And um, I'd see loads of these and hardly ever see red eye. Well, I'd get, I'd get a couple a year and I'd be very excited. So it's quite, quite bizarre to see how things have changed with these two species. Quickly going to go through the weather. We've heard about what kind of a year it was, but it's often nice to see in these plots. I'm not going to go into too much detail of these plots, but I borrowed them from the Met Office, thanks to Neil Kay. And you can see overall, it was a very warm year, one degree above average for the, for the uh, compared to the long term average. And you can see, especially in June, there was some really, really hot weather. But before that, in April and May, leading up the start of the season, it wasn't particularly uh, warm compared to the long term average. And then it really did get going in June. And actually, it was, as we'll see in a moment, it was quite wet as well. And then there was a heat wave later in early September, too. It's still part of the season. But yeah, the rainfall was quite uh, amazing, really, a really, really wet year third wettest in Northern Ireland and the sixth wettest in England. And you can see here that the start of the season in April, it was very particularly wet there. Um, but then in June, it was, it was much drier. But then, as, as we've heard from the, the wider countryside butterfly survey, which takes place in July and August, wet again, making it really hard to get out and do these transects, which makes it all the more amazing that we, uh, we get such good coverage. And then finally, the sunshine, because of course, that's very important and getting those butterflies out, um, even in the kind of slightly cooler weather. You can see there, no surprises in June, it was well above average. But generally speaking, it was around the average for most of the year. Um, so that has a really big impact on we, what we see, not just on being able to get out and do the transects in the first place, but also on the detectability of the butterflies when we're out on the transects. So what did this translate to in actual butterfly numbers? So this plot here just shows you the average number of butterflies recorded across all transects in the UK on the uh, y-axis there. And on the x-axis, it shows you the BMS week number. So going through from the start of April week one to the end of September in week 26. And the red line is 2023 data. And then the solid black line is the last 10 years before that. Um, averaged over that and then the dotted line is a series showing you how uh, the butterfly numbers have been recorded over each week going back to 1976 and you can see here in that red line that in April and May the numbers were well below the average oh, I don't know what's going on with this um, it seems to have got some kind of automatic uh, screen movement but um, I'll keep going backwards on it um, and you can see there that suddenly 
as we come into June, that red line is not only earlier than the, both the 10 year average and the long term average, but it's quite a high peak as well and quite a wide peak. So suddenly things really picked up there. And we were definitely thinking, I think there was a couple of theories when, when we weren't seeing many butterflies early in the season one was that perhaps they were all just a bit late because of the cool and wet weather um, compared to the previous years and if you look at this you can see some of that pattern emerging so species like uh, so just to explain this graph on the on the y-axis you've got the mean flight date for species recorded in 2023 and then on the uh, x-axis you've got the same thing but for the last decade before that to try and compare uh, a recent kind of trends in, in phenology with last year and you can see that those early species, the one-to-one -one line here, if you've got dots that are above it, that means that it came out later in 2023 than the 10-year average. And if they're below it, then it came out earlier. So early in the season, around May time, you can see orange tip, grizzle skipper, these spring species were on average out later than they were in the previous decade. But then as we move into June, July, you can see that species start to fall under that line again. So they're actually coming out earlier because that real heat wave in June started to make things totally reverse, which was quite amazing. And then later in the season, due to the wet weather again, things started coming out a bit later. So it wasn't just a phenology thing, it really was that some species early in the year didn't do too well. And that's what I'm going to come on to talk about next when we go through the trends, which I'm sure is the bit that everyone's waiting most for to see how each species did. This is the families. I'm not going to dwell on this too much, just to acknowledge the fact that you might be thinking, why on earth does the vanessid one show a decline when red animal does say, well, well, I don't put the migrant species in there because things like painted lady fluctuate so much that kind of has a real impact on that uh, statistic. So I take them out. So that's heavily weighted by the small tortoise shell, which we'll come on to. Similarly for the yellow uh, whites there, you can see I exclude the cloud yellow from that. But generally, most groups were above the 2022 for the as a group that is whoops swallowtail isn't any of these groups so i always show it independently and it had a pretty bad year seventh worst on record down by 41 percent and then looking at the skippers overall you can see that um more species showed an annual increase and showed a decline and some did rather well there like the checkered skipper um you can the, the I'm going to show these plots over and over these tables over and over again. So I'll quickly explain. You've got the bar on the right, which just shows that um, as you go up the, and into the blue area, that's where species showed an annual increase, and as you go down with the red, that's where they showed an annual decline. I'm just going to focus on a few species. I can't unfortunately focus on all 58. That would be really nice. But I've just picked out some of the ones that I think are interesting for one reason or another. The Lulworth skipper. Uh, species that had a long-term trend. You can see that in that last 10-year period now, which is shaded um, orange on the on the plot there, it, whatever colour you can see there, it's an orangey colour to me. Um, that's now showing this short-term trend of a, of a significant increase of 37%. So, uh, sorry, it's not showing a significant increase on the little skip. That's just gone to the next slide. But um, it's basically reversing that trend at the moment. It's doing rather well. And we had a 70% increase in 2023 and the fourth best year on record. Large skipper, we might kind of, you know, I think goes under the radar a little bit. It's expanding its range and it's showing no significant pattern in the long term. It's neither significantly declining or increasing. And it had a little bit of an increase in 2023 by 14%. But actually, when we look at the short term for this, uh, the last 10 years, it's showing a long to, uh, short term decline of 37% and that's significant. So what's going on with the large skipper, I don't know. Check skipper had a phenomenal year up by 51%, the best year on record. Um, so this, this really is fantastic news, up by 494% uh, in the short term as well in the last 10 years. So really good news for this rare species. Moving on to the whites, you can see that brimstone had its best year there and a really even split there with four species showing uh, an annual increase and four species showing a decline. I'm going to focus on the common whites as I often do because they're some of the species that we see the most of. Um, you can see that large white and small white both enjoyed quite a good year, whereas green vein white, which is one that uh, requires more kind of damp uh, habitats and stuff, actually had a really bad year across all countries as well. So the table there shows you the country splits. And you can see that green vein white had its worst year on record in Scotland and Northern Ireland and didn't do particularly well in England and Wales. So you can really see the impacts of that drought the year before as well uh, on some of these species. And that's why uh, we'll come to talk about the ringlet later as well, which you saw in a previous uh, talk as well. So the brimstone here, 
um, had its best year on record up by 59%. And this seems to go from strength to strength. It occasionally has a little dip, but you can see that the long-term trend is of increase. And what was kind of interesting here is I didn't feel like I saw that many early in the year compared to normal. Uh, so again, I've got this plot here, which shows the average number of butterflies recorded and the red line is 2023. And then we've got the 10 year average and the long term average. And you can see the first uh, when it comes out of hibernation, uh, overwintering, sorry, um, in the in the spring, you can see that's relative, it's above what it has been in the averages, but it's not markedly above. It. But look at that when it comes out back out of these the, the kind of the actual generation from those overwintering adults, you can see that that's much higher. And also a lot earlier as well than the averages. So that June weather really brought these butterflies out. Great news. So moving on to the browns, uh, quite a lot of the browns had a good year. Um, we've already mentioned the ringlets, and I'm going to talk about those common browns in particular because they account for more than 50% of all butterflies on the transects. And you can see here, meadow brown, oh God, I don't know what's going on here. Meadow brown, gatekeeper and marbled white all had substantial increases compared to 2022. And ringlet, unfortunately, didn't suffer the same fate. It was down by 37%. And this is probably because of that drought the year before again. So the same with green vein white, as we saw earlier. And what's remarkable about ringlet is it's been increasing, it's expanding its range, it's been increasing in the long term really significantly. But actually, when you look at the last 10 years, it's showing a 42% significant decline. I suppose that's probably got something to do with the fact that we're having a lot of quite dry summers, although obviously last year uh, wasn't that dry. So we'll see how that impacts this species next year. The other brown that didn't do very well was Scotch Argus. Uh, it had its fifth lowest index on the on record for the UK, and that's for the second year running now and down by 22% uh, after a decline in 2022 as well. But if you look at uh, England and Scotland there, you can see that last year when I presented these results, it had its worst year on Scotland, uh, but it's only a second worst year in Scotland this year because it had a slight annual increase of 43%. But in England, it recorded its worst year down by 69%. So moving on to the fertilities, as a group, these had the biggest increase um, there you can see by 16%, uh, but an even split between how many species showed an annual increase compared to an annual decline. Heath fertility, one of the rarest species, 138% up compared to 2022. And that's that gives it an above average year, but that's still great news when you consider where it was in previous years. And if you look at that short-term trend now, isn't that remarkable? It's up by 223% in the last 10 years, and that's a significant increase now. So that's really good news for this rare butterfly. And that's a, a, a consequence of all the fantastic conservation work that's been done for this species. Unfortunately, the small pearl border fertility didn't have such a good year. It was down by 9%. And I, I, I think I showed this one last year as well. It had its worst year on record across the UK. And that was true for England as well, with significant decline since 1976 as well of 67% and down by 13% compared to 2022, where it already suffered a decline from the year before. But its fortunes aren't the same in Scotland, and I've probably showed this before, um, up by 2%, so not only a modest increase, so it didn't have a particularly good year in 2023 in Scotland either, but look at the long-term trend, it's up by 120 to, uh, 110% in the long term. So a real kind of dichotomy of how well it's doing in different areas for this species. So the Vanessas, as I showed you earlier, the, the annual kind of change in the group is heavily weighted by the fact that I've left the migrants out, but look at that number for Red Admiral. And I'm going to focus on the Red Admiral and the small torches as we go on, but look there, three species showed an annual increase and three a decline. White Admiral showed no change compared to 2022. But what a remarkable increase. We've seen that for the, for the, uh, from the BNM data as well and from the wider countryside butterfly surveys. Um, a huge increase in this species. I've just never seen so many of them myself. Um, you know, they were just everywhere. And you can see there that it had a good year in all the countries for which we're able to, to create trends for, best year on record for both England and Scotland. And here I've just given a table of the 150, uh, sorry, not the 150, all the sites that recorded over 100 in a single count on their transects. You see there's quite a few sites there, and those that have got little uh, asterisks by them are those that did this on more than one occasion. And then in blue there, I've just highlighted that 150 sites produced an annual index of 100 or more, which is quite... I think that's quite remarkable for an admiral. They're not usually in such high numbers. And the pictures I've shown you there are something that I rather naively always used to look for red animals on. I, I never found them on anything other than nettles. I know they do feed on other things. Um, and as a boy, I used to kind of 
find loads of painted la- uh, painted ladies, loads of small tortoise shells and peacocks. And I'd get really excited when I came across a red admiral caterpillar because I rarely ever found them. This year, I was walking around Didcot, which isn't renowned for its butterfly numbers. And there's a uh, pallet of the wall is all along all the kind of walkways around here. Uh, and it often gets mown up. And I found these spinnings on literally just covering all the plants. And in like five minutes, I already found 20 of these caterpillars in there. And I collected quite a few of them because I knew it was going to get mown in a couple of weeks because they strim all this down. And I reared them through. And interestingly, not a single one of them emerged an adult. They were all parasitized. And when I got these identified to confirm it, they were all Sturmia bella. So I didn't get a single adult out of that lot, which was rather disappointing. But I did find this not just around Didcot when I went into work near Wallingford, down little alleys in the middle of the town, this poetry of the wall, which you would have, you'd be forgiven for thinking that nothing would even venture down these alleys in between tall buildings, absolutely covered in these caterpillars. It was literally everywhere. It was just amazing. And conversely, small tortoise shell, I saw less than 10 last year. Um, I, I'm struggling to think I didn't get one on my transit for the first time ever, which is incredible. Um, and it suffered a really big annual uh, decrease of 46%. And it's got worrying long-term and short-term 10-year trends of decline. And it had its worst year on record. Uh, so really worrying times for the small tortoise shell. Um, and I've just shown you this plot here. This, this map to show you how it differs around the countries. Because remarkably, despite having its worst year on record in England, its third worst year on Wales, and its sixth worst year in Scotland, although in Scotland it didn't show an annual change, but it was still a, a very low index value. But in Northern Ireland, look, it had its second best year on record. And it's showing in the short term over the last 10 years, a significant, significant increase. So remarkably different, depending on where you are for the fortunes of small tortoise shell. And it'd be interesting to hear on why people think that might be. Duke of Burgundy doesn't fall into any of these groups, so I always just show you the trend for this. And unusual amongst most of the spring species, because things like green hair streak, orange tip, and, and the other spring species showed annual declines because of that poor weather. This species actually was up by 21% and produced an above average uh, index. So moving on to the blues, the biggest group, these showed, again, like the fertility is one of the biggest annual increases as a group overall. And you can see a really even split between those species that showed an annual decline and an annual increase. I don't have time to focus, even though this is a big group, I don't have to focus on those. I've not pulled out the large blue, but it did have its best year on record. Instead, I focused on the brown args and the common blue. Because rather like the red admiral and the small tortoiseshell, these two species for me locally seem to be reversing their fortunes quite remarkably. So... Um, I'll be calling it the common argus and the rare blue soon around where I am because common blue was in lower numbers than brown argus on my transit by quite a large factor. I was seeing up to 50 per transit. Why is it a long transit for brown argus in its second generation? And you can see it had its second best year on record and was up by 168%, whereas common blue was down by 13%. And when we look at this in more detail, so these plots again show you um, the, the red line is the 2023 data. And we're looking at the average number of butterflies recorded across a transect compared to the 10 year average and the long term average. And on the top plot is for the brown argus and the bottom plot is for the common blue. And you can see there that it really is quite a reversal um, of what's happening with these two species. And the interesting thing with the brown argus is the, the first peak, so the, when it came out in April, May, it was a bit later than normal, actually. You can see there that it came out a bit later than the 10-year average uh, on the whole. But not a massively greater peak than the long-term average. But look at that second generation, absolutely massive and really broad. There was They were just everywhere, um, rather like the Red Admiral, really, but not not to the same degree, perhaps. Whereas when we look at the common blue plot below, you can see the second brood wasn't any better than the first brood, which is unusual. And it's well below the um, the long term average and the 10 year average for this species. So really different fortunes for these two species. And finally, I just wanted to pick up on the green hair streak. Um, this was down by 31 percent. Another species that probably suffered because it's spring flying species. And the, uh, the, the start of the year really was quite poor on the transects. Um, and it was probably almost over by the time we got the the, the nice heat wave there. But it does suffer uh, different fortunes depending where you are. So in England, it's doing particularly badly with a long term decline of 38 uh, percent. Not so bad in the last 10 years, uh, but it did suffer 36 percent annual change compared to 2022. It did badly in Wales in 2023. But the long term trend there is a significant increase and quite a remarkable significant increase of 230 percent. 
And in Scotland, it was actually showed an annual increase, perhaps because it, it's out on the wing a bit later there. So it did manage to take advantage of that warmer weather by the time it had arrived. And the long term trend and the last 10 year trend for Scotland, although not significant, are both of increase. So I'd just like to thank there. Sorry for it's always uh, whistling through these really quickly. I know it'd be nice to see the trends for everything. Um, you can look those up, of course, and there will be more information once the press release comes out and everything. So do keep an eye on those things. I'd like to thank everyone for going out and all the hard work, all the people I work with, and also all the people that give me these photos, because as I've shown you, and I'm not particularly good at that. Um, so thank you very much. And also apologies for my, my somehow setting up the screen so that my slides kept skipping without any control. There's always something, isn't there, Mark? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fantastic, as always. It's absolutely amazing to see uh, to see all of the um, information. So thank you very much for that. So we've got one more talk uh, before we have a break, uh, and that is by me. So I will cut out on the introductions. So. Uh, there's a lot said and written about gardening for uh, butterflies and um, uh, including by butterfly conservation, of course, but also from uh, from many other uh, organizations and individuals. And um, but a lot of these things that are recommended to uh, to do in your garden don't really have good scientific evidence uh, behind them. So we set out to address this with uh, to address this evidence gap using data from Butterfly Conservation's Garden Butterfly Survey. Okay, I can't make the slides move now either. There we go. Um, the uh, there's a lot of interest in wildlife friendly gardening uh, that seems to have uh, uh, be increasing, which is great, and uh, not only in the UK but uh, elsewhere as well. Um, and there is some research evidence to show that wildlife friendly management of gardens can be beneficial for wildlife. Uh, well, we also know that the landscape surrounding your garden, for example, whether you live in a very rural area or in a highly urban area, uh, is really important in determining the wildlife that you will see. So in this recent piece of work, this recent piece of research that was published uh, earlier this year showed that uh, there was higher abundance and uh, species richness of butterflies in UK gardens uh, that had a higher quality for wildlife. But this quality was a, a really sort of nebulous uh, compound value based on all sorts of different features that people had in their gardens, like ponds and trees and all sorts of different things. And there was no way of separating those out to see what the uh, what the impact on butterflies was for any particular uh, um, feature in your garden or way that you manage your garden. And so our aim was to assess whether two simple and often recommended wildlife friendly garden practices, namely leaving the grass to grow long and having flowering ivy in your garden uh, have any effect on the butterflies that you see in your garden. And the ultimate aim is to be able to provide evidence-based advice to gardeners to, who want to take action to help butterflies. And in order to look for such effects, we also have to understand the influence of the landscape surrounding the garden as well, so that we can kind of take that into account. Uh, now, as with Mark's previous talk, these results aren't published yet, so please don't uh, you know, enjoy them, enjoy the sneak preview, but please don't share these results uh, anywhere else outside of, uh, of this meeting. So no, no social media, please. Um, so we used, as I mentioned, data from the Garden Butterfly Survey. Uh, this is a, a really simple thing where participants note the number and the types of butterflies that they see in their garden throughout the year. It's a really easy thing to take part in. I'm sure many, many of you are involved in it already. Uh, there's no specific method. You don't have to search for a particular number, a particular amount of time or a certain number of days. You have to follow a, a route around your garden or anything like that. And we use six years of data from the Garden Butterfly Survey from 2016 to 2021. And there were over 4,600 gardens took part uh, at some point during that six year period. 
but we filtered that down to a set of over 800 gardens where there had been a good level of recording throughout the year. And from these, we were able to estimate the total abundance of butterflies seen in each garden and the relative species richness in each garden. And it's important that we looked at relative species richness, so rather than the total number of different species, because of course, an average garden in Southeast England is bound to have, you're bound to see more butterflies than you would in the most fantastic garden in the far north of Scotland, simply because there are lots more types of butterflies in the southeast of England. So that's why we use this measure of relative species richness. Essentially, it's the, the proportion of the butterflies that are available in your, in your broader area uh, that you've actually seen in your garden. It's also important to mention that we excluded butterflies that are rarely seen in gardens. So all of this analysis and the results are focused on the, uh, the butterflies that are commonly seen in gardens. Now, um, I mentioned that the, the methodology of garden butterfly survey is, is very simple. You can kind of do whatever you like, really, as long as you count and, and record the butterflies that you see. Um, and therefore, it's important at the start of this analysis to, uh, to know that the, uh, the changes in butterfly numbers recorded as part of Garden Butterfly Survey are reliable. And in order to do that, we, uh, we took the Garden Butterfly Survey data and for each species, we calculated the change from, uh, from year to year for each pair of consecutive years during that six year period. And then we compared those changes with the same measures for the same species from the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, the gold standard uh, data. And uh, fantastically, there was very little difference. So that's really great news. And it shows that Garden Butterfly Survey recording does reliably capture the wider trends in butterfly populations that, that are going on out there across the whole landscape of the UK. So we've got uh, the, these two measures from each of these over 800 garden butterfly survey gardens, the total abundance of butterflies seen and the relative species richness, how many different types of butterfly were seen. Uh, we then also used data from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology land cover map in order to characterise the, the landscape around each of those over 800 gardens. And then finally, and most importantly, we used information provided uh, by the Garden Butterfly Survey participants themselves about both the size of their garden and about these two wildlife gardening practices. So do they have long grass in their garden? And if so, how much? And do they have flowering ivy? And that using those three um, sort of types of data, we asked uh, and tried to answer these three questions. So firstly, does the landscape surrounding your garden affect the butterflies that you see? Secondly, do, does having long grass and flowering ivy make a difference in your garden? And then finally, are those two things related to each other? So uh, does, it, does it matter what your surroundings are like in terms of whether having long grass and flowering ivy will, will work, will bring benefits for butterflies. So we'll start with the landscape, the surrounding landscape. And indeed we found, not surprisingly, that the surrounding landscape makes a big difference to the butterflies that you see in your garden. So particularly the amount of woodland uh, in the local landscape, uh, the more woodland there is, the more uh, butterflies you will see. Um, similarly with arable farmland, the more arable farmland there is, the more butterflies you'll see in your garden. And again, not surprisingly, it's exactly the opposite with urban areas. So the more urban the immediate surroundings of your garden, then on average you'll see fewer butterflies and of fewer types of butterfly as well. So that's great. So we now we know we've shown that the landscape does affect the landscape around your garden does affect um, what you might see in your garden. We also show that there is a significant uh, positive relationship between garden size 
and what butterflies you'll see and how many you'll see. So that on average, larger gardens, uh, you see more butterflies and more types of butterfly. But this is the question. This next question is the one that we're really interested in and hopefully you'll be really interested in it as well. So does the presence of long grass, does having long grass in your garden affect the butterflies that you see? Well, yes, it does. So we found that the, the presence of long grass uh, significantly increases the total abundance of butterflies that you see. So it's not an enormous difference. So those are the averages. So if you've got a garden with, with no long grass, then on average, you see 94 butterflies uh, in a garden with long grass. On average, you see 102 butterflies. So it's not an enormous difference, but it is a real difference. It's statistically significant. It's a real effect. It's a real benefit. And we also see a difference in the richness, this relative richness. So you see more butterfly species in your garden uh, on average if you have long grass. And again, it's not an enormous difference, but it is a real difference. It's statistically significant. And those are the findings for all of the uh, sort of common butterflies that visit gardens. We also redid this analysis for uh, two subsets. So we, we took one group um, where the butterflies use long grass as their caterpillar food, where the caterpillars eat grasses. And another set was all the other butterflies, the caterpillars don't eat long grasses. And that was really interesting because that showed that this, uh, this positive uh, effect here of long grass is entirely on, on butterfly abundance, total abundance, is driven by those butterfly species that use long grass uh, for their caterpillars. So yes, having long grass, allowing the grass to grow long in your garden does benefit butterflies. What about the amount of long grass then? Does it matter how much long grass you've got? Well, yes, it does. So the more long grass you have, the more uh, butterflies you will see, the greater the abundance. And again, it's st statistically significant relationship. Uh, and it also exists for the richness of butterflies, the number of different types of butterfly that you will see. So the more long grass you've got, the better. Uh, not many of us have got the luxury of having over 300 square meters of long grass in our gardens. Great if you do, um, but uh, it, the general message is there that what you know, whatever size of garden you have, the more of it that is long grass, the more butterflies you will see. And again, both of these significant relationships are driven by the butterfly species that use grasses uh, as food for their caterpillars. So yes, long area of long grass is important as well. So what about flowering ivy? Does having flowering ivy in your garden, something that we often promote to people, uh, does it affect the numbers and the types of butterflies that you see in your garden in the autumn? Well, actually, interestingly, it doesn't uh, overall. If you look across all of the species, all of the common uh, butterflies that visit gardens as a group, uh, but there are some significant effects and some significant benefits. So for um, the abundance of Red Admiral, we were just hearing a lot about, had an amazing year last year, but for the abundance of Red Admiral and Comma taken together, and these are two species that seem to really prefer um, ivy nectar, They're, they commonly feed at uh, uh, ivy blossom in the autumn. If you have flowering ivy in your garden, then you will see significantly more of these, uh, these two species. Again, it's not a huge difference. It's very, in fact, it's a very modest difference, but it is significant. It's a real difference. It's a real improvement. And then the other thing, not again, perhaps not surprisingly, um, is holly blue. So uh, as you'll know, holly blues lay their eggs on ivy flower buds in the autumn. And if you have flowering ivy in your garden, you do see significantly more holly blues in your garden. Again, it's not an enormous effect, but it's a real significant difference. So both of these easy, cheap, well, free, in fact, 
um, wildlife friendly gardening practices significantly increase the abundance and the species richness of garden of butterflies seen in gardens. But the which is fantastic and uh, obviously is is you know really what we hoped to find. But the changes are small for the average garden. The reason for showing this picture is to highlight the fact that there are nearly 730,000 hectares of gardens in Britain. And so these small differences, these small improvements for butterflies from these wildlife friendly practices, garden practices, really will scale up if lots and lots of people do it. And that links nicely to a Butterfly Conservation's Wild Spaces programme which is all about engaging with many, many, many more people and encouraging them to do something positive uh, to create places where butterflies can live. So the final question then was about, OK, so we now know that having long grass and having flowering ivy does bring benefits. But do those benefits differ depending on what kind of landscape you live in? Because we also know that the landscape surrounding your garden makes a difference. So we investigated that. We couldn't test all of the possible uh, combinations because the, the, there wasn't enough data to do that. But it turns out that uh, in, uh, in terms of arable land, uh, the, it does make a difference. So this plot's a little bit more complicated. So I'll just explain it briefly. On the, on the horizontal axis here, we've got the amount of arable land in, uh, in the local surrounding area around a garden, um, ranging from uh, no arable land down at this end up to entirely arable land in the surroundings. And this is the total abundance of butterflies that, that are seen in the garden. And then the blue line is what happens if you've got long grass in your garden. And the, this orangey red line is what happens if you haven't got long grass in your garden. So you can see that in uh, at this end of the graph, where there's a lot of arable in the local landscape, then it makes an enormous difference uh, if you have long, oh, sorry, gone the wrong way, if you have long grass present. So in these highly uh, modified human, intensively human managed landscapes, you, can, you might expect twice as many butterflies in your garden, uh, or nearly twice as many butterflies, uh, if you have long grass present. Uh, compared to gardens that don't. And we also found relationships in the urban area. Now we already um, established that, uh, and there are many other studies that show that urbanization is bad for wildlife, bad for insects. And we, we showed earlier that the more urban surroundings of your garden, the, uh, the fewer butterflies and the fewer types of butterfly you'll see. But, so again, these are, so we've got uh, abundance, butterfly abundance on this plot, and species richness on this one. And here the vertical, sorry, the horizontal axis is the amount of urban land use in the surrounding landscape around the garden. So we're interested really up at this end of the plots, which are quite urban areas. Most of us live in urban areas, in towns and cities. That's where most, uh, most people in, uh, in the UK live. And you can see uh, that all the lines are pointing downwards. Uh, and that's the effect of urbanization, decreasing wildlife. But the, um, that loss of wildlife as, you, as the area becomes more and more urban is much less, is significantly less uh, if you have long grass in your garden than if you don't. So if you, have, uh, if you live in a, in a built up area, then having long grass is disproportionately beneficial. Um, you'll uh, you'll have a better, you know, have more impact on butterflies than you, if you live in a really rural area. Hope that made sense. Right, running out of time. So just a quick summary then. Uh, so garden size and the surrounding landscape are important. They're really important in determining what butterflies you might see and how many you might see. But these two um, wildlife friendly garden practices, having long grass, and uh, having flowering ivy do make a significant difference. They do improve the number and the variety of butterflies that you'll see. And they're particularly beneficial in gardens that are in highly arable and urban landscapes.
And finally, while our study using the garden butterfly survey data was only in private gardens, residential gardens, there's every reason to think that the same measures will have similar effects for butterflies in public open spaces, such as parks and cemeteries and road verges and so on. So finally, just thanks to everyone who uh, takes part in the Garden Butterfly Survey, uh, to Peter Eels, who created and managed the, the Garden Butterfly Survey website during the years that uh, of data for which we, we've used in this study, uh, the Heather Corey Fund from Butterfly Conservation, which funded the research, and our colleagues, uh, Emily Dennis and Nigel Bourne for their input as well. And that is me done. Right, well, welcome back everyone. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to stretch your legs uh unfortunately i spent my whole time trying to trying to fix my camera but at least it worked so that's good so three more talks to go and uh the first is by david james who's the county butterfly recorder um for northamptonshire over cool. to you thank you okay thank you very much well thank you very much for the invitation to um speak at the uk Re uh, recorder meeting uh, just to fill you in a little bit about how things have been progressing in northamptonshire um since i started uh, by way of an introduction, I've been the county recorder since 2016. I uh, joined the committee in 2015 as the membership secretary. Uh, and then uh, within 12 months, uh, Doug Goddard, a good friend of mine, um, he was the county recorder for 35 years in Northamptonshire, and he decided uh, that he wanted to retire. And he asked me if I'd uh, take over the role. So as you can imagine, I did feel that they were rather big boots to fill, but... Um, uh, yeah, I said yes. Um, and yeah, it's been an enjoyable journey, I have to say. Um, so I'm affiliated with the Beds and North Ants branch of Butterfly Conservation. Um, you can see the two logos in front of me. When I started in 2015, uh, the logo on the left was the uh, logo, but now it's gone over to the modern one on the right hand side. And when I first started, this is how we received all of the butterfly records. Um, They're all either on paper um, or it was via phone call, text message. Um, a lot of them did come in via email. And of course, every single one of those then have to be put into um, our database. We use Levana, um, have, uh, supplied by Jim Asher. Thank you for that. Um, but they all had to be put in one by one. Uh, now, I work full time and uh, I was finding it quite difficult to keep on top of things. And I was trying to look at new ways in which I can get data into our recording system um, easier. And... I then started attending the Northamptonshire Biodiversity Records Centre, uh, the county recorder meetings. Um, each, normally about two or three times a year, they hold county recorder meetings where all of the county recorders um, from different taxa all sit around a table, discuss recording. And then this amazing website um, was starting to be spoken about called iRecord. And it sounded to me like the answer to a lot of my prayers so I jumped in um, almost straight away. So I started as the verifier for Northamptonshire in 2017, and I could quite quickly see the benefits of using the platform uh, because um, the verification is very easy. Um, you can contact people very easily if there is a query. And um, the, one of the other good things about it is the mobile phone app. Um, which is fantastic for those of you who are using it. You, you know how good it is. I use it myself all the time, but it's definitely, definitely worth trying out. And then the next uh, milestone in the journey was in 2019 when Butterfly Conservation offered training in QGIS. Um, now, this was another brilliant thing for me because uh, one of the good one of the things I'm really interested in, as well as butterflies, is distributions and being able to show those distributions in uh, a quite a good way. So during my um, when I did my training, um, I took those skills when I got home and I developed this. And this is my Northamptonshire template for butterfly recording. And I use this nearly every day when I'm when I'm verifying records. It makes things so much easier to have everything in one one place. Um, there's a few examples of the layers that I use on this template. Uh, once you've set the template up, you can save it. And obviously, every time you open QGIS, um, you can see a few of the the layers there: the Northampton boundary line, 
Um, then there's like grid references. You got you got the so we got the monads, the tetrads, Northamptonshire parish boundaries, which is really good uh, for when people are recording out in the um, open in the wider countryside. And of course, the other great thing about this is the uh, Field Studies Council tools, which make uh, finding grid references um, extremely easy. And the Biological Records tool, which which you can use to input all your spreadsheets and um, and select all the data that you need. And by using that, uh, you can create some really, really nice um, distribution maps. And uh, these have been very popular. I write um, uh, an annual review every year, and it makes it a very simple way of seeing the distributions and in a very clear, clear way. Now, one of the bonuses of using the iRecord phone app is it uses the phone's GPS. So the difference is the distribution maps that you can use, um, you can create using this data are really, really detailed. And here is uh, an example of the sort of distribution map that we used to have um, before the, this level of detail. Whereas this is Salty Forest, these are the wood white distribution in Salty Forest, where Salty Forest would be split into Salty Forest North and Salty Forest South. Um, so that would be the level of distribution. But by using the mobile phone app and asking people to record at the highest possible resolution where they're seeing certain key species of butterfly, such as the wood white, you can generate maps like this. And this is obviously really, really helpful when you're talking to land managers, such as like, well, in this case, it's the FE, because it shows exactly what rides uh, the wood whites are using. And more importantly, it's showing what rides the wood whites aren't using. Um, so targeted conservation work on those rides should then hopefully increase the species, uh, increase the species, yeah, increase the species around the forest. And this is an example of um, the urban spread of records. Uh, to me, this is really, really um, encouraging to see because um, we never used to get this level of detail in urban records before. And the good thing about this, again, using the iRecord mobile phone app, um, is you've always got your butterfly notepad book in your pocket. So wherever you are, if you pop into the shops, if you're taking the dog for a walk, if you're sat in a beer garden, you can just take out your phone and record the butterfly uh, while you're there and send that off and we get it. I should also point out at the minute that I can only really speak for Northamptonshire. I record is the way I really, really like the records to be sent in. Um, but always talk to your local county recorder because they might have other methods, preferred methods for you to send in your data. And this is something that I'm currently playing with a little bit. I'm becoming a bit interested in whether there's a correlation between localized butterflies and um, elevation. And uh, in order to start uh, doing a little bit of research about this, I've downloaded all the uh, DTM layers. You can get them off the DEFRA website. Um, this is the LIDAR data, and this is what Northamptonshire looks like if you scrape away all the, all the houses, the roads and the soil. And one of the good things about this is when you start putting data on top of this, uh, you can then create a transparent layer, layer and put that over top of a Google um, image. And you can create really detailed three-dimensional maps. Uh, this is Firming Country Park, and this shows you the dingy skipper distribution. And you can see how the dingy skippers are using those south-facing slopes. OK, the next thing I want to talk about with this is um, something I consider to be very important as a county recorder, and that is sharing knowledge. Um, as you see, these are a few of my photos. I do enjoy um, taking photos, but by using things like this, you can really get uh, the, the, you can get the message out there for people to start recording butterflies. And obviously, one of the easiest ways of uh, contacting the public is via social media. Uh, so in 2015, when I started as the membership secretary, I set up the branch Twitter account. And that has become really, really popular. And um, a few committee members also joined uh, Twitter when this came out. And um, it's, it's a great way of enthusing the public. And it's really, really popular. The other thing I set up in 2019, believe it or not, was a WhatsApp group. Um, this was designed uh, because I it became quite clear 
Um, because I'm also quite a bird watcher, and there, anyone who's a bird watcher knows a lot of bird watching WhatsApp groups. But there's a lot of people who want to share knowledge, but social media um, isn't quite for them. And WhatsApp was a great way of getting um, getting these people involved, and the WhatsApp group has really took off. I have to say, um, so much no, so much so that it actually expanded um, after a while, and it now includes moths and dragonflies as well. And there's some quite lively debates in the summer, uh, who's seeing what and where. And the other thing to mention as well is Facebook. Obviously, Facebook's very popular with a lot of people. Um, the branch had a Facebook page, which was really, really good. Great way of sharing um, branch details and stuff. But in two, 2022, um, as a branch, we decided to change it to a group rather than a page. And that just allows for easier um, participation. So that way people could then post their photos on it and be, you know start some debate. And the other good thing about social media, one of the things that we utilized in um, sort of 2018, where we had an absolutely fantastic uh, black hair streak season, um, is when you get a really good flight period for a butterfly, it's great to share that information and get people out there looking for it. So particularly with the Black Hair Street, you say the Black Hair Street's doing really well, you get loads of people will go to Gladthorn Cow Pastures to get their photos. Then after that, you encourage them when they're out and about in the, in the country parks or anywhere near where they live, just stand next to a Blackthorn for a bit because a lot of these butterflies are quite under-recorded. And um, yeah, we added quite a few dots to the map. They're a lot more um, spread out than we originally thought. Likewise, with the white um, letter hair streak, um, getting people to look at elms and with the migrations as well, the cloudy yellows and red avenue ears like we had last year. Um, but obviously, we've also been very uh, lucky in Northamptonshire to have some fantastic national projects. Uh, one of them, Woodland Wings, uh, which was there to help with the wood white and also help with black hair streak in the Rockingham Forest and uh, no, sorry, the Salsey Forest and Yardley, Yardley Chase area. And uh, back from the brink, obviously, incredible media attention around that with the uh, release of the checkered skipper. Um, that also helped a few of the other butterflies as well, key species, particularly grizzled and dingy skippers. And obviously the checkered skipper thing is ongoing. Back from the brink is finished, but checkered skipper project is still ongoing. And uh, now we have the, also the start of the threatened species recovery project, which is helping the wood white. But all of these projects also have their own social media accounts, which really helps to raise awareness and raise record awareness of recording in Northamptonshire. Um, websites, obviously another great way of getting people enthused and sharing information. Uh, this is the Beds and Northants local branch of Butterfly Conservation website. Um, at beds uh, north ants uh, butterflies.org.uk um, it's a wealth of resources about and it shared about the beds and north ants region um, but last year i um, set up my own and so i've developed the north ants butterflies website uh, which is just for northamptonshire um, and that's the home page um, there's a lot of information on here there's um, up-to-date sightings there's species accounts um, there's things about recording butterflies, there's articles in the articles section, there's uh, ways of uh, articles about identifying confusion species. Um, but the real mantra of the website is what's written across the thing is the butterflies north out of Northamptonshire and where to see them. It's all about helping people see butterflies and hoping that they will record them when they're there. So there's various site guides um, to help people see the butterflies and find them and each site guide does have quite a detailed account, shows you where to park, do you need to pay to park. Um, I'm hoping to add a bit of an accessibility thing in the future um, with that. And there's also um, a tutorial on uh, on the recording butterflies section. If you go on there, there's an iRecord Butterflies app tutorial, which takes you step by step how to record a butterfly and how to record a list of butterflies. And this has actually been really um, successful because when I set this up last year and published it, uh, there was a marked increase. And a lot of people that were still sending records in via email suddenly started sending them via iRecord, which helps me as well, too. And it's also a great way of sharing good news stories such as this with the brown hair streak. Um, the Brian Laney, the plant recorder for the, well, the joint plant recorder for Northamptonshire, found the first brown hair streak egg. Um, 
uh, just before Christmas last year. So we have we have a returning breeding species, which is absolutely fantastic news. And I also write the annual review. So if you look in the article section, you can see the review of Northampton Shears butterfly season from the year before. And uh, the other way of getting knowledge out there is obviously to get up and go and meet the people. Um, so I do an awful lot of uh, walks and talks. Um, and there's various people, groups that you can speak to, obviously. You can talk to local wildlife groups. Uh, many pocket parks, country parks have friends groups. You've got the RSPB local groups, the Wildlife Trust local groups. But one thing I noticed with a lot of those groups, um, they're brilliant to talk to, but most of the people there are already um, sending in records. Um, but the, the working with other organisations has been really, really good. So that's working with people like the Wildlife Trust, um, on the screen there, you can see the popular moth and butterfly event that I hold in conjunction with the Wildlife Trust every year at Pittsford Reservoir. Um, I also run an identification course for the Wildlife Trust as well, teaching their ecologists how to identify butterflies in the field. But the last section is giving talks to non-wildlife groups, and that is really where it's at. Um, that's talking to lo local parish groups, over 60s clubs, WIs, gardening groups, photographic groups, all these sort of places. Then going out there, sharing photos and getting people enthused about butterflies and reminding them that it's not just the butterflies in places like Salsi Forest or Glapthorn that we're interested in. We're also very, very interested, as Richard said, in the butterflies in your garden and in the wild and wider countryside. Um, also, stately homes. Stately homes often have gardening and uh, country fairs and stuff like that, which are great to turn up and talk to. So what has this achieved? Um, so that's a graph showing the increase of records uh, since 2016. So in 2015, when I took over, we were averaging around two, about around five to seven thousand records a year. Uh, now we're averaging around 28,000 records a year. And last year, despite the appalling weather, uh, we actually had the best recording year ever with just over 31,000 records. So that's quite an increase in quite a short amount of time. Um, so the county database has a total of around 246,500 records since records began in 1976. 183,700 of those have been received since 2016. So that's 75% of the total Northamptonshire database has been achieved since 2016. And by encouraging people to record in gardens and the wider countryside, we have increased the spread of those records quite a lot. Um, so the only thing I've got left to say is a big thank you to everybody who sent in records. Um, yeah, and that's the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. That's great. Thanks very much, Dave. Loads of really positive um stuff there lots of uh, good suggestions and things um so thank you very much for that that's well, great yeah. and to time as well which is brilliant so uh, thank you thanks thanks very much for coming we will move on um our next speaker uh was uh, alluded to earlier on this topic it's something slightly different uh, because it's not actually about butterflies themselves it's about people and uh, and the uh, the benefits that taking part in um, in all of the recording and monitoring that we've been uh, talking about and celebrating today uh, can actually bring to us as the people doing that work. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Carly Butler, uh, who's a psychologist from the University of Derby, uh, to give the next talk. Hi, Carly. Oh, hello. I'm just. Can you see? my yeah. screen and, yeah. and it's the right it's, screen okay it's perfect oh. yeah oh great brilliant Thank fabulous you. okay just sort of navigating myself um here yeah thank you for thank you for having me it's it's a pleasure to be here um i'm yeah as Richard said, I'm going to talk today about some um, research, a research project um, between the University of Derby um, with Butterfly Conservation. Um, it has just been published, so you will be able to go and look at the paper and you can talk about the results as much as you like. Um, I'll have the link for them at the end and put them into to the chat. Um, yeah, so I'll, yeah, I'm researcher on nature connectedness. I'm going to get to what nature connection is and what a researcher on nature connectedness does soon. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to give you a bit of background to the study um, to explain kind of what we're looking at um, and why. 
Um, and in terms of research about the impact of nature-based citizen science, so there are a lot of studies looking at what value does citizen science serve, and um, obviously there's a lot. And it's normally looking at these three kind of key areas. So first of all, as we've seen from the talks this morning, you know, there's a huge contribution to science. So all of the data that can be collected by people going out there and collecting the data and analyzing it and um, being involved in research means that scientists can do a whole lot more than they could possibly as a small kind of research team. So it has a huge contribution for science. Um, we also know there's a big contribution for, first of all, like just general awareness about different species. Um, but also the skills and knowledge of the, the people who are taking part in collecting data. So identification skills um, and more understanding about species behavior and conservation issues more generally. Um, and finally, there's some research that shows that there's an increase in kind of pro-nature behavior by people who take part in, in citizen science um, projects. So there's this there are a lot of benefits that, that have been recognized in terms of citizen science. But we know much less about some other aspects of what taking part might involve, um, particularly the, the psychological aspects of citizen science. So the first thing um, is how people feel when they take part in citizen science projects. So is there any impact on um, that, you know, do they respond, respond emotionally to the act of monitoring and counting different wildlife? Um, does it have any impact on their, their well-being, emotional well-being, um, psychological well-being? What's that experience like? Um, and secondly, does taking part in citizen science have any impact on people's relationship with nature? So does it change how they will feel about the natural world, um, think about the natural world and engage with the natural world more generally um, beyond just the species they might be involved in, in, in researching um, and, and working in that area? Um, so this kind of curiosity about these areas that, that inspired this um, collaborative work with, with butterfly conservation, um, looking at the impact of the big butterfly count on people's well-being um, and nature connectedness. So I'm just going to explain what I mean by um, nature connectedness a little bit and tell you a bit about what previous research, what we know about the idea of nature connection. Um, so effectively, it's a measure of the strength of someone's relationship with nature. Um, so just as you can talk about, you know, the level of someone's happiness or the level of someone's loneliness, we can talk about the level of their, um, their relationship with nature, how close they feel to nature. Um, so people who have a really high level of nature connectedness have quite a strong emotional bond with nature. Um, they're more likely to say they feel a part of the natural world, not separate, disconnected from it. Um, and nature tends to, to matter a lot to people who have a really strong relationship. Um, so in this sense, it's kind of similar to how we might think about our relationships with different people. You know, you might know a lot of people and you feel much closer to some of them than others. Um, but that's not always the same. It's not kind of linked to how much time you spend with them. You can spend a lot of time with, with people, um, you know, working in a big busy office. You might see someone all day, every day, but not really have that emotional connection. Um, and the research has found that's similar with nature. Okay, so it's different. Uh, the strength of our relationship doesn't always depend on how long we spend in it. Um, it's that more psychological, emotional aspect. So there's been a lot of research. This has kind of developed over the last 15 years. And there's, there's now thousands of studies that have explored, you know, now we can measure this idea of nature connectedness. And it's found that the more nature connected people are, the happier they are and more satisfied with life. Um, and there's a range of other um, positive outcomes from this. So greater self-esteem, more creativity. Um, and yeah, there's a really strong body of research around that. And we know that people are more likely to help nature when they have a high level of nature connectedness. Um, and this is around kind of carbon cutting activities as well as um, environmental based activities. So it's good for both people and planet. Um, we know that nature connection can increase um, or decrease, and the research basically finds that the thing that increases it the most 
is by really simple everyday activities. You know, it's not about going for big walks in really wild areas. It's simply that that noticing and appreciating everyday nature. Um, however, in the UK, so research by a National Trust with the University of Derby found that a lot of people don't tend to do this kind of everyday noticing of nature. So 80% of people say that they rarely or never watch wildlife or take photos of nature. Um, and 62% rarely or never listen to birdsong or notice butterflies. Um, so that's quite that's quite high proportion. Now, nearly two thirds of the population aren't noticing butterflies. Um, it kind of makes sense then that when you look at levels of nature connection in the UK, they're much lower than most other countries, um, lower than all other European countries and a lot of um, other international nations as well. So these things go hand in hand and similarly with well-being. So when you look at a country level, the higher a country's nature connection level is, the higher the well-being is. So these go hand in hand. Um, so noticing butterflies might be important for, for these kinds of reasons. Um, just to return back to, to research on citizen science, we know that when people take part in pollinator surveys, um, they do tend to increase their appreciation of, of bees and butterflies and pay more attention to it. And this links to pro-nurture behavior um, and that feelings of being fascinated with these with, with bees and butterflies um, play an important role in this. So the more joyful someone feels when they um, start to, to, to notice the, the species that they're monitoring, um, then the greater the increases in their noticing and their pro-nature behavior. Um, but we don't really know much about whether citizen science activities themselves increase nature connectedness, um, aside from some really recent, so last year, some experimental studies um, were done where kind of pseudo citizen science. So they, people were given activities that were like what they would do in the big butterfly count um, to see if it would increase nature connectedness and well-being, and it found that, that it did. So there's some kind of relationship there. But um, we need more studies that look at kind of real world, large scale citizen science projects. So that's kind of very much the, the motivation for, for the research for the big butterfly count. So, um, yeah, moving on to the, the study itself, we were looking at, so this is in 2022, um, and we looked at the impact that taking part in the big butterfly count had on nature connection, um, on health and well-being, on anxiety. Um, we looked at nature and butterfly noticing as well, um, because this is so important for ongoing sense of nature connection. So did people, were they more likely to notice butterflies and nature more generally after taking part um, and we looked at pro-nature behavior. We also looked at um, people's emotional experience of taking part. So we asked them, you know, when you took part in the survey, did you experience feelings of joy, anger, fascination, compassion, disgust, fear, and interest um, to see if there was any relationship between the strength of these feelings and the outcomes. Um, and finally, we asked people just with open text to, to share some comments about their experience of the big butterfly count um, and how it impacted their thoughts, feelings and behavior. So um, this just gives you an overview of the, the timing of, of when we issued these surveys, um, because we, we, we asked people to take part in three different surveys. So when people were signing up to take part in the Big Butterfly Count, they were invited to take part in the research as well. Um, and at that point completed the first survey, which asked all these questions before they had done the Big Butterfly Count. Um, we then had the Big Butterfly Count period over three weeks. And the day after that closed, the second survey was sent out to people again. Um, and so over the next two weeks, people completed the survey, which we called the, the Time 2 survey, T2 survey. Um, and then we also wanted to do a follow-up because if there was any impact of taking part, did that last or did it kind of fade away once the, the, the count period was over? So um, another three weeks on, so this is five weeks from the end of the, the big butterfly count, we sent out the third survey. Um, and one thing to note was we had a fabulous response rate from, from people, first of all, signing up, but the follow-up surveys of um, 382 at the second time and 345 at the third survey um which is really which is really good to see 
Um, and we also had a lot of great open text comments. So 18,000 words were contributed about people's experiences, which gave us really good insight into the more kind of qualitative aspects of it. So in terms of results, um, these are the results from the first, the, well, the, the second survey that was done. So this is looking at the, the difference, the change from before taking part in the Big Butterfly Count to afterwards. Um, and a really key thing was this decrease in anxiety. So a decrease of 9% um, of anxiety levels between, between those two time periods. So suggesting see that, that taking part in the, the count um, led to this more calm, um, less anxiety. We also found increased nature connectedness um, and also increased noticing of butterflies and increased noticing of other nature more generally. So people were more likely to say that they would kind of pay attention to, to nature and butterflies around them. Um, the second lot of results relate to this, you know, from the beginning right to um, five weeks after the big butterfly count. And so this was looking at these more sustained effects. So did any of these effects last? Um, and we found still kind of an increased noticing of butterflies. So people were still paying more attention to butterflies than they had before the count. Um, and there was increased well-being found as well from compared to before the count. So there's some evidence here that 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 these things lasted, you know, they, they were changing um, people's people's experiences of engaging with, with butterflies um, and their well-being. Um, there was also an effect of the strength of people's emotional experience of counting butterflies. Um, and really interestingly, so the more the more joy, compassion, and interest people felt, the greater the increase in nature connection. Um, but that was even the same when people rated higher levels of anger, disgust, and fear. So any kind of emotional um, intense response led to more increase in nature connection. Um, and we also found that the more joy, fascination, interest, and compassion people felt, the more that they were more likely they were to report a greater increase in their noticing of butterflies and nature. Um, Okay, so just I'm, I think I'm okay for time. Um, just some of the, the qualitative comments really kind of um, painted a really nice picture of what's behind some of those, those statistically important findings. Um, and we organized the comments into three main themes that kind of went across, across the whole collection of, of feedback. Um, the first was around joy and fascination, and this was the, the most frequent response that people were providing about their experience, so people's enjoyment, basically, of taking part, um, and some of the reasons for that enjoyment, um, something that they often look forward to, um, they, they experienced a sense of well-being from taking part. For a lot of people, it was the pleasure in sitting quietly um, and being in the moment, kind of everything else was put to one side while the focus was on the butterflies for that time period. Um, there was a lot of joy when people saw a particular species that they'd hoped to see and some seemed to have seen some that they weren't expecting to see. Um, there's a lot of fascination reported um, and a lot of appreciation of the details of, of butterflies' appearance and their behaviour. Um, and a couple of quotes there about, you know, looking for butterflies has been a huge solace um, and reports about helping the well-being. And the, the second quote about observing them for a longer period of time made me wonder exactly what they were doing and how they were feeling. So there was this more kind of this closer engagement with butterflies. The second was kind of the other end of the spectrum that, that there were a lot of people commented on feelings of sadness and concern. Um, and this was mainly driven by people who had low counts. So they, they didn't see any or they saw very few um, particularly those who felt they had seen far fewer butterflies than they had the previous year. Um, and there were a lot of expressions of worry about that. Um, so there was a sense of loss and there was a sense of anxiety. So some people talked about that in relation to the, the bigger ecological and climate crisis. Um, and as part of that, there were some expressions of, of anger um, about the, the causes for this. So some people would talk about what the local the gardens around them were like so following on from from Richard's talk you know um where gardens had been lost um and through to kind of bigger issues around government and action and so on or lack of awareness or care from others um so again a couple of quotes there so I've enjoyed doing the count for the past four years but I've been concerned that while I've seen a lot of butterflies 
The numbers year on year are decreasing. This year was by far the worst with few butterflies in my garden, though I haven't changed it at all. Um, and they find it very worrying. Um, the final theme that kind of again followed on from that was around taking action. So people said that taking part in the count itself helped to kind of buffer some feelings of sadness and concern um, because it felt important and worthwhile. Um, there was an appreciation of the sense of community with other people taking part, other citizen scientists. Um, and it was seen as an opportunity to raise awareness with family and the wider community. Uh, a lot of people talked about how it influenced their gardening practices. Um, so by kind of noticing which which plants the butterflies seem to appreciate more than than looking to to plant more more like that. Um, so yeah, so it changed people's garden management. Um, and it also a lot of people said that they 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 felt they tried to stay positive by taking part in, in the big butterfly count and changing their gardening. You know, this this helped to kind of buffer the feelings of of worry that had been reported. Um, just kind of the, the, the summary then of, of all that, I've kind of raced for a lot of it, but I guess, you know, the headline is that, that, that counting butterflies is good for both people and butterflies um, by improving human nature relationships and well-being. Um, there's a nice kind of circular effect here where, where something as simple as, you know, taking part in the survey and counting butterflies can increase the extent to which people will notice butterflies and other nature um, and we know this is important for nature connection, for well-being, um, and that that then has a flow and effect through to pro-nature behavior. Um, ideally, you know, then you've got more gardens with long grass and then you've got more butterflies to count. So it will kind of, you know, it starts to set up a loop, hopefully, that's really um, hopeful for, for, for people and, and butterflies. Um, it's important to kind of show that citizen science has this other element to it you know as well as um, awareness the contributions to science the contribution to people's skills and knowledge that it can have this this deeper effect between relationships and well-being um, and in terms of applications we know that most people who took part in the survey had done the big butterfly count in previous years and we also know that they were quite highly connected with nature to start with but they still had an increase by by taking part in the count. So um, there's really exciting opportunities for people who have never taken part. You know, if they start to take part, we'd expect that the, the, these effects would be even greater um, and even higher. Um, it points to the need to kind of integrate the the nature and health um, agendas. You know, there are health <laughs> health benefits from taking part in this kind of activity. So um, the environmental and health sectors could work together. Um, and it's also the what was coming through the qualitative stuff that there's a potential response here to to well not to increasing eco and climate anxiety to addressing the increase in eco and climate anxiety um, as as a help for that. Um, I think I've just got some links here, but I'm going to copy them and put them into the chat because I don't know if you'll have the slides, but I'll, I'll do that soon there. Um, and just to thanks. To everybody who took part um, to butterfly conservation um, and some financial support to, to kind of fund the study there. And that's me. That's great. Thank you very much, Carly. Really interesting um, study. And as you say, you know, really a, yet another reason to, uh, to do all this recording and monitoring, uh, a sort of unexpected benefit. Um, so that's great. And uh, last, but by no means least, and um, sorry for the, the delay. Thank you for your patience to all the speakers who've, uh, who've been uh, on slightly behind time um, in this second part of the meeting. But I'm absolutely thrilled to, uh, to welcome Professor Jan Christian Hubble from um, the University of Salzburg in Austria. Um, Jan's published a load of papers in the last few years that I found incredibly interesting, uh, all based around sort of citizen science kind of uh, butterfly uh, information, some of it very old and some of it contemporary. And uh, um, over to you, Jan, to, uh, to tell us about your work. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, for giving me the chance to to show you some of our uh, recent results. 
So the talk uh, will be uh, briefly show you what you can do with a uh, kind of time series. And I think at this uh, point, again, uh, I think it's very important to, to underline the huge value of uh, observation data, of monitoring data, um, uh, because I think yeah, if you want to evaluate the current status of uh, biodiversity, you really have to, to look back and uh, therefore, I think yeah, monitoring data are, are of huge value to understand what is going on in our landscapes in terms of uh, land use change, but also climate change. So what I'm presenting now are, are data which we compile together with uh, colleagues from different museums, natural history museums in uh, Munich, but also here in Austria. And uh, therefore, I start with uh, this uh, picture, dead butterflies, of course. Uh, sometimes it's also a kind of a sad uh, impression, but nevertheless, such data sets are uh, really telling us a lot, uh, giving us a lot of information about uh, what happened in terms of uh, trends, species richness, abundances, uh, community compositions, commun community structures, and so on. So um, I will start with some examples about uh, time series and land use change. Then I continue and showing you some, some uh, studies we did during the last uh, years about uh, climate change effects. And at the end, I give you a very brief uh, summary. Again, um, just to mention this, uh, all these studies were uh, done together with uh, many, many other colleagues, Thomas Schmidt, Patrick Groß and so on. They are working, uh, some of them are working in these uh, collections, in huge collections in Munich, in Austria, in Poland and so on. Okay, yeah, let's start with a paper. Jeremy Thomas, one of the most famous uh, butterfly researcher, I would say uh, in Europe or even in the world, he published uh, a very nice paper about butterfly communities, uh, which are definitely under threat. And in this paper, he very nicely summarized and indicated that uh, there are kind of two waves of extinction. A first wave, which is strongly related with the direct destruction of habitats, like destruction of bogs and so on. And a second wave, which is still going on. This is the current wave of extinction, which is mainly driven by a reduction of habitat quality. And in this paper, he also indicated that not all the species are responding in a, in a different, in, a, in, in the same way. They are responding very differently. We have species which are coping very, very well with our current landscape structures, but others, the specialist species, they are really under threat and are strongly declining. And actually, this is what we also found in our studies. And I want to show you now some of these uh, examples. So first, uh, let's go into detail effects of land use change on biodiversity on butterflies. And uh, this is a study we published some years ago. It's about a calcareous grassland site in uh, southern Germany. Uh, here you can see a photograph of this habitat. Uh, it's uh, it's looking quite nice, but it's a typical situation of uh, nature conservation areas. You can see uh, uh, such a very isolated grassland site, which is nicely managed, but uh, embedded in a more or less intensively used landscape. You can see agricultural landscape and settlement areas, and of course also uh, kind of pesticide applications in the lower areas and so on. So, um, and this is a situation which is uh, quite difficult also for butterflies, I would say, uh, because most of these nature conservations are really yeah, geographically isolated and uh, very small. And the big question now is, are species able, are populations able to persist in such small islands over time? And we had uh, the chance to use data sets which were collected over 
uh, two centuries. It's a kind of a hotspot of butterflies, and there were many, many people, lepidopterists, uh, working on these uh, on this grassland site, and we compiled all the data. And um, our results, briefly to show you, uh, it's a real hotspot of butterflies. Um, uh, more than 130 different butterfly species, in including some Bernard Moss uh, species. And this was the situation during the 50s, uh, 60s. Yeah, more than 130 different butterfly species on this grassland side. It's a calcareous grassland. At a certain point, they realized that it's a very important hotspot area. And then afterwards, they even started uh, putting a kind of a protection status, a conservation status. And also, they started with management activities there. In the meanwhile, the situation is looking like that. Almost half of the species went extinct from this grassland side. And uh, this is not unique. We found very similar trends for nature reserves in uh, Germany, but also in Austria. And we think that uh, this is because of stochastic effects. It's because of the small, the isolated character of these habitats. And after a while, we have a, a stepwise loss of uh, species diversity, and we have a lack of recolonization of butterflies from outside, from other areas, yeah, because they are too far and yeah. So this is a, a, a difficult situation. And for this study, we also uh, look for traits. We categorize the butterflies into rather generalist species and rather specialist species and the redless species and so on. And this is uh, another finding from this grassland side that on the one hand, we have an increase in the proportion of generalist species. So the generalist species are coping well with such a situation, but the endangered or red list or specialist species are decreasing over time. And this means that um, the endangered butterflies cannot persist in such isolated habitat sites over time. This is a very difficult situation. I want to show you another study. Actually, the, the first one I showed you, uh, this was restricted to one small grassland area. This study here was compiled over major part of southern Europe. And I just want to show you here um, the different degrees of, of reduction. And you can see that uh, for southern Germany, we have a negative trend in the relative abundances, or uh, in other words, in the number of local populations of butterflies. And we can see that um, there's a kind of an acceleration of butterfly decline over time. Means that, especially during the past two, three decades, we have a very strong decrease uh, in the vanishing of local populations of many, many butterfly species over time. I want to show you one last uh, time series study related with land use change. This was a study we did uh, during the last uh, years uh, here in uh, Austria, in a part of uh, Northern Austria. And uh, we also looked uh, about butterfly diversities in different areas. And for example, uh, you can nicely see that for the low altitude meadow butterflies, so all the butterflies which are occurring in meadows, which are on the lower elevations in the valleys, uh, you can see that there's a very early break point means that the start of a decrease of these butterflies started already like uh, during the 50s or 60s. Uh, however, for example, for the alpine meadows, we have this break point, which is uh, quite later or means earlier, recently in the 70s, 80s. And uh, I think this is also very important. Not all habitats and not all ecosystems are affected in the same way. So for the low altitude meadows, for example, here we have the situation that very early, the people started with uh, 
and intensification with the destruction of these habitats. While in the Alpine area, we still had long times of quite good conditions, but now uh, we also have these negative trends that uh, we have a decrease in uh, abundances of butterfly diversities uh, over the past two, three decades. And this is mainly because of abandonment, because uh, many, many alpine meadows are no more extensively used how it was during the past yeah. And uh, yeah, I think this is very important also to consider that uh, the ecosystems and the responses in these ecosystems are uh, different over time. Let's have a look on uh, time series and climate change. So, so there are climate change uh, effects which are driving the distribution of butterflies on the one hand in respect of time. For example, we can uh, see that uh, the butterflies in Austria, for example, and also in, in parts of uh, Germany, they are occurring about two to three weeks earlier than, uh, than uh, two or three decades ago. And also in autumn, we can observe that some of the butterflies are occurring like uh, two or three weeks uh, longer than it was uh, like two decades ago. So um, I would like to, to show you one example, the violet copper butterfly. It's a very beautiful and uh, very endangered butterfly. Here's a typical habitat of the violet copper, Lucena helle. It's also a very important butterfly in respect of nature conservation. And uh, what we did, actually, we, we collected samples across Europe, we collected uh, butterfly samples across Europe for this butterfly. It's a cold adapted boreal montanus butterfly. This butterfly needs really rather cool climatic conditions. And the butterfly is currently still uh, found in the higher elevations of Europe. And uh, this creates a situation that we have uh, highly disjunct, very isolated populations which are scattered across Europe. And this uh, strongly uh, drives also kind of genetic differentiation processes. This is the genetic structure of this butterfly of the violet copper. The different colors indicate different genetic units, different genetic characteristics. And as you can see, for example, the populations in the Pyrenees, they are different to the, are, are genet genetically different to the populations in the Massif Central, Jura, Vosch, Ardennes, and so on. All these middle mountain areas where you still can find this butterfly. So when we are looking on the distribution and the climatic niche of this butterfly, uh, the picture shows you very well that these reddish areas indicate the higher elevation areas, indicate the optimal climatic niche for the violet copper butterfly, for this uh, butterfly species. So you can see the Pyrenees again, you can see the Alpine region, and also all these middle mountain areas where you can still find local populations of this butterfly. So when you now use these informations and you look into future, what will happen in the future in times of climate warming, in times of uh, massive changes of the climatic conditions, uh, you have a situation like uh, this. The reddish areas are shrinking, are decreasing strongly. And this means that... Uh, most of the distribution areas where you have a suitable climatic niche will yeah, strongly decrease. And maybe in like 50 or 100 years, we will have uh, last remaining populations here in the Alpine area. So this situation of the wildlife copper is typical actually for cold adapted butterfly species. They are on the one hand migrating towards the northern areas. You know all these papers about the range shifts, but also they are uh, climbing into higher elevations. And here again, uh, we did some studies based on time series, based on uh, historical data. 
uh, for the Austrian area. And this is one study I want to present you and I want to show you what uh, is happening at the moment with butterflies, uh, the, the rather lowland butterflies in Northern Austria. And you can see that uh, we have an increase, we have a shift of butterflies into higher elevations. So here, this is based on like 100 different butterfly species. We looked uh, over time, the mean area where they occurred over time. And we can see that especially during the past 10, 20 years, we have a significant increase in the mean area, in the mean elevation of occurrence of, of uh, lowland butterfly uh, species in Northern Austria. So this is a typical response actually of, of the butterflies. They are following their typical climatic niche. And in terms of climate warming, we have this situation that they are kind of climbing up into higher elevations. And we did a similar study based on the modeling approaches and the climatic niche. And this is specifically for mountain butterflies. We can again see what happened during the past decades. Again, a typical uh, climbing up, a typical movement into higher elevations during the past decades. And uh, we, we, we can see around about 300 meters of, uh, of, of climbing up into higher ele elevations within around about three or four decades. And I would say this is a very uh, impressive, but also a, yeah, a, a alarming signal, let's say, because I mean, uh, two, three, four decades is nothing in terms of times of evolution. So this is a very fast response, what is going on at the moment. Okay. I would like to also say uh, something about potential limitations because all these data sets are kind of, uh, yeah, from collections, from field books. So it's a compilation of different kind of data. And uh, just also to let you know that these uh, data sets, sometimes it's complicated to work with such data sets, but nevertheless, I think uh, such data sets are of very high value because they give you uh, give us a lot of information about what is happening at the moment and what changed over the last years or decades. So some of these uh, studies, for example, they are strongly uh, restricted to a specific area. And then, for example, the refuse is always telling us, yeah, um, this might happen maybe at a specific site, but uh, it's not maybe valid for entire Europe or the world. So this is uh, one point. Then in this uh, case, I'm mainly working with butterflies uh, because I like butterflies, but also because the data sets available are uh, rather for, for, for butterflies and other groups, uh, it's, it's often very difficult. And then um, sometimes we also have only a very limited time period with uh, solid, with good data. So this is, uh, again, limiting factor. And then, of course, the data quality is rather low because these are kind of yeah, a random uh, sampling, uh, different kind of data compiled in one huge data set. So it's a non-standardized sampling. And this is always very difficult especially when we want to say something about abundances um, and uh, densities of butterflies. Okay, nevertheless, I think uh, it's very important to work with uh, such historical data sets. And I want to sum up. Um, the time series we analyzed indicate um, negative long-term trends in respect of species richness, but also in respect of relative abundances. And uh, yeah, we have a reduction of species richness and shifts in community structures. I think this is very important to really, yeah, to realize that we uh, have a situation that very specific species, mainly the specialized species are vanishing from our landscape. So we have a shift in the community structures over major parts of 
Europe. Yeah, specialist species are more affected than rather the generalist species. And the decline of butterfly diversity is even accelerating. So what we observed is, especially for the past 10, 20 years, we have very strong changes. And especially, uh, and, and the, the, the climate change uh, data tell us that the species are responding now. So there happened long term, uh, there, there was no effect, but uh, since about 10, 20 years, we have very strong uh, effects and responses. So, uh, and yeah, of course, we can see rain shifts into higher elevations based on such time series data. Okay, yeah, thanks very much uh, for listening and uh, yeah. Uh, thanks very much again for, for inviting me and for giving me the chance to present some of these informations. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's really fascinating. Good to see. Oh, I think my camera is being weird again. But um, yeah, <laughs> thanks very much for that. And thanks for your patience uh, waiting right till the end of the meeting. But uh, yeah, some really, really uh, sobering. I mean, it, it's great, great illustration again of what can be done with uh, these kind of data, the kind of data that, you know, we're all still collecting and our, uh, our predecessors collected in the forms of, uh, of pinned butterflies in museum cabinets and, uh, and their writings in notebooks. But, uh, but yeah, pretty, pretty worrying stuff. Thanks, Jan. I'm gonna pass over very briefly to Russell to uh, close the meeting. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Richard. Uh, sadly, my camera is working, um, which isn't great. But just to say a very, just a very quick uh, finish, really, just to say thank you to all the speakers. Um, it's amazing when you just think, picking up on your point, Richard, that, you know, we're just talking about butterflies and look what you can do with butterfly data, whether it's about uh, people's ability to connect with nature, whether it's about understanding climate change. It is absolutely fantastic what we can do uh, with all the data that uh, so many people who are here today and 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 who can't be here today uh, uh, contribute so thank you everybody for that thank you every everybody for uh, for your attentiveness for the great questions uh, it's always a it's always it's always a bit of jeopardy on these meetings when you've got all of these questions coming in both on the chat and in the q a um, but thank you for all of that thank you for being engaged and um uh, I, I wish you w wish you all a uh, successful survey season. Thank you. Mm -hmm.